thank you for that kind of introduction. It's always uh, a little daunting. But what I can tell you for anybody who's sort of thinking about their career, this whole community is a fantastic community to be part of. And I am lucky enough to have effectively, I dreamed that I could make my career uh, using geography and sort of things around it. And I started in the data world um, a very long time ago, perhaps when I first met Mark back in the 1980s and 1990s. And uh, when you were the managing director of GMAP at that time, I think. And um, basically, um, by continuing that dream, I have continued to do things like, as you said, ordinate work with Ordnance Survey, um, working at the United Nations. Now I am involved in the World Bank, and we'll talk a little bit about that in my talk. But also, it also takes me and it could take you if you ever wanted to, if you ever feel that you want to do anything with your specialist work of urban analytics, um, into the reserve forces as well. And um, absolutely, uh, you've mentioned that I'm the honorary colonel of 135 Squadron of the Royal Engineers. They are the, the area which you join. And um, you only have to do sort of about 20 to 25 days a year. But absolutely, the nation is always interested in you. And then I'm also happened just in February this year to find myself receiving another similar letter, which uh, I'm lucky enough comes, uh, um, I didn't expect at all, saying, could I become the, an honorary group captain? Um, which means I've joined the Royal Air Force and joining 601 Squadron. And my role is to basically advise the new Space Command. So you don't get paid for either of those honorary roles, but if you joined up in yourselves, you do get paid. But um, what I'm really, the emphasis I'd like to say is our subject can take you anywhere. And it really, really can explore so many areas. Today, I'm going to very much be talking about the power of location. Um, and Mark and I have been discussing this morning about uh, the thing we're definitely agreed on is location goes through everything we all do, urban analytics, and then into a wider sense, the whole of the geospatial community. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Because you may or may not, some of you will be experts in this area. And forgive me, um, I was asked to make sure that everybody became a little bit more knowledgeable in this area. So the first few slides, for some of you, may, you may think, oh, I, I know all of this. But you might not have ever thought about it, but everything happens somewhere. And the moment you start to think about that, you suddenly realise that that piece of data on the location is so vitally important. It underpins all of our daily lives and it also helps make decisions for people who are in the position to make those decisions. So location information is extremely important. Um, some people online I know will remember uh, a colleague talking about how 95 5% of all data actually contains a locational element. And, you know, whether that figure is right, which I think it probably is, absolutely, it shows that it's a vital part of the data ecosystem. And you can imagine, if you just had this as um, numeric data, perhaps some population information on this area of Sao Paulo, you would consider that everything was the same. But actually, as you can see, by adding some contextual information, often from uh, imagery, uh, basically you start to really understand what is going on. You would never have understood there were such high value properties uh, being alongside um, perhaps some more normal properties for that area. Then location's been key to us all in the pandemic. 
And in fact, for us geographers, um, it's been a place when all of a sudden we have seen geography everywhere. And we've seen things described geographically very much. Um, right from those early prime minister briefings, which I have to say 85% of all information that came to you between March and May last year was coming through basically the Royal Engineers ge geographical sections. And whether it's today we are able to see what is going on in our areas, how does it uh, affect us, and even start to make our own local decisions. And um, what we're seeing all the time is changing face of uh, COVID, but people understanding it, understanding it via location, and really beginning to make their own decisions. What we also know is we're really starting to understand what it means to us globally. And the, the information of this week absolutely starkly brings the next slide into, uh, in, into stark contrast. This is the WHO dashboard for total vaccines administered. And um, we always knew, you know, every single one of us knew because we learnt it if you lived here in Britain, about the, the Delta variant um, and the, how the Delta variant spread because we had so many infections uh, last, um, uh, last Christmas time. And once again, as soon as we find people unvaccinated, we see these variants coming. But very much, it's all been down to geography that people have had this real understanding and the power of location. Now, I'm lucky enough to work for the World Bank for part of my time. And the World Bank is one of the largest donors to the developing or middle-income world to make a difference. And uh, we'll talk about their values in a little while. But a senior director of the World Bank recently said that geospatial information, which is the professional name used by people for location information, provides great opportunities to, to accelerate the development of nations and address global, national and local challenges. But no longer are even more sophisticated maps needed, but the development of spatial data infrastructures are required to underpin all decision-making of countries. And it, here you see a, a paradigm shift where you move from sort of that flat maps that many people will remember through to multi-dimensions and to that data stack. And it's that data stack that absolutely brings in much of the work you do. And I spend a lot of my time explaining to cabinets of countries about the, the geospatial data infrastructure. They already have data infrastructures in their countries. They'll have a financial uh, infrastructure. They'll have uh, sort of economic prosperity infrastructures. But it's all based on location. And for many countries, they are now wanting to build these infrastructures where basically each piece of data is held effectively in themes and they put a level of governance around this. And that level of governance makes sure that organisationally it's sustainable, um, that uh, uh, global standards are used, that uh, there is a real understanding of the metadata that's behind that data, and then there's also the technology. But it used to be this whole area when some of you will have been in geospatial information earlier on in your careers, and it was very technology-led. Now it's very much sort of strategy-led. And what we've seen is it's very much about getting people in every walk of life to understand the power of location and making sure they have the right skills and resources. And we'll talk a little bit about those skills and resources in a while. And what we've seen now is globally this idea of governance behind data is very much adopted. 
And this is uh, a joint initiative that has now been adopted by 139 countries at cabinet level, where it's called the Integrated Geospatial Information Framework. And it's not just a, about the data, the urban data, could be also the rural data, but it's also about making sure that it's supported by the legal and policy frameworks, supported by the right governance to make sure that the ethics of data is fully um, uh, integrated, but also that data is um, maintained in the way that's required by a country and that to the global standards so that the data stacks can all be interoperable. Making sure there is enough capacity and education. And there are now programs around the world where tens of thousands of people are being educated in this through various different means. And uh, making sure that there is the proper communication and engagement throughout uh, countries. And I work in often very difficult environments around the world, often where, as you'll see later, some of the worst nightmares of people have come to, come to pass where perhaps they used to be able to sustain themselves on their land. They've now got to move into the urban environment because there's nothing left. It's just a dust bowl. And there's been no intervention to stop that dust bowl. But it's absolutely very much the roles of so many at different groups to see if we can sustainably change the lives of those communities. So it brings in some of those very biggest topics of climate change, migration, and many other things. Now, we all know that all the time we're even here, we are beacons of data. And we know that data is collected from satellites, from the air, um, from uh, various different uh, other uh, autonomous vehicles and also by ourselves, by our own devices that we're carrying. And what we've very much seen is the resolution that one can get from that data is ever-changing. And um, basically uh, what we're seeing is that timeliness in that data, doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can get much greater understanding of what is going on. So whether it's looking at difficult parts of the world or it's just looking at parts of the world like London, it's still the same. And it's in much higher resolution than ever before and ever increasing. What also is now ever changing is that we can now see through cloud. And, um, you know, we've just heard that a plane is going to go up from Frontex to look for those migrant boats that was announced this week. Well, that's obvious. You just put a radar onto that and you'll be able to see through the dark and through the clouds and be able to, see, be able to more clearly target where are the, um, the, the people who are... Uh, you know, basically um, the masters behind the, the, uh, the, the very sad things that are happening in France. And we also can have transparency now on what exactly is happening at industrial facilities. Um, you're probably aware that much of the global stock markets are very, very interested now in using this information and analysing it because they're able, from this image and from sequencing of these images, for instance, to look at what are the global oil stocks. And they can do that from the shadow, which tells how, um, how full are those uh, oil, oil um, uh, uh, storage plants. So a lot of associated information can come from that kind of uh, world. And we now have video from satellite, and you're seeing all the time much more of that appearing. Very much, much of the location information only becomes valuable 
when you are able to see change over time and uh, very much taking place in an area. And what we see is that's used in many, many different ways. Because when you have complicated geography, where perhaps uh, there is great difficulty. This is uh, Ethiopia. I took this photograph relatively recently. And as you know, Ethiopia is under siege, particularly Addis Ababa at the moment. And this is Addis. And what we know is that when you're trying to understand what's happening on the ground, there will probably not be modern data. It can look like that. And how can we, as professionals in this world, help people to move from that into needing to do their own planning for COVID? We've just seen the extensive work that's gone on COVID planning using location. But yet, for many countries, they had nothing. And throughout the pandemic, I was working on assisting countries to do their own COVID-19 planning, but using uh, remote uh, data and for them to try and work out their infections and be able to effectively plot it on for them what was new geography. And so there was a lot of that kind of work going on. Because when, you know, we probably didn't realize how rich we were and how lucky we were when we were all locked down. But for many, many countries, it was much more chaotic than uh, it might have seemed to you in uh, the UK. For instance, we obviously had all the problems of the pandemic with our own education system. But in South Asia, which is officially defined as Afghanistan, Bhutan, Bangladesh, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, they already had a crisis of education with 95 million children of school age being out of school. And these statistics are before the recent crisis in, in Afghanistan. And basically, as a result of COVID-19 crisis, a further 430 million children, just think of that number, have no longer access to school education due to the crisis that's gone on uh, during COVID-19. We also know that location and the analytics that you might do really can help this topic of modern slavery. I've done a huge amount of urban analysis work looking at modern slavery. There are 45 million people. So that's more than 50% of the United Kingdom's population who are living in modern slavery every day. And basically, around the world, there are ways to detect it using our kind of analytics. And uh, you might be surprised that in a talk on urban analytics, you end up talking about modern slavery. But it's very, very important. And uh, whether we're looking at modern slavery in Slough, or other urban towns of the UK, or we're looking at it in uh, places in former Eastern Europe, or in South America, it's the same detection ways of doing it. And finally, climate change. Climate change is obviously something I'm sure every single one of us feel very passionate about. And you might be thinking it is affecting you a little bit because it's raining a bit more or it's a bit warmer or it's a bit this, a bit that. But it's nothing like it is in many of these places where they've not got access to vaccines, where their community has turned from being subsistence to being a dust bowl where there is no food and the infrastructure has completely broken down due to the heat. I don't know how many of you have spent any time in over 50 degrees. I have. I'll tell you, it's very, very hard to exist. Now, I realize I'm not adapted to it. My body isn't adapted to it. But 
just the heat on a tiny bit of skin if you've got it open to anything is so hard. And they have been blighted by many new insects and then, of course, floods. So that brings us to the urban reality, that everybody's moving to the urban world. And there are good reasons. 80% of global economic activity is generated in cities. Basically, industries benefit from that density. Basically, we know, and these figures are probably not accurate, but there'll be, you know, there are seven, between seven and eight billion people, about seven and a half million, we th a billion, we think, in the world, and two billion additional residents in cities between 2000 and 2030. One billion, one billion people live in slums to be near jobs and opportunity. Basically, one and a half billion exposed to cyclones and earthquakes in large cities by 2050, up from 680 million. And 1.2 million square kilometers of new urban build up area by 2030. And then, of course, we turn to the greenhouse gases. 80% of greenhouse gas emissions and 70% of energy consumption is attributable to cities. So you can just see, when you look on the world stage, the crisis and why urban analytics is so, so vital as a topic and so important. And, um, you know, there is an urgency for action. Now, I said I work partly for the World Bank. And um, you may not be aware, it's part of the United Nations. And I started working there in 2015. And they have two goals. Uh, one, to end extreme poverty. And that is people living on less than $1.9 a day. And that is what is the official um, guideline of extreme poverty. And to foster income growth of the bottom 40% of the population in every country. And uh, I could have done a whole uh, presentation on how what you're doing and how the World Bank work together. But I realised because of time that probably wasn't the best use of the slides. But I just want to make sure you understand how bad has it got. Now, I used to say there were 700 million people, which is 10 times the population of the whole of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. 10 times that population basically lives on less than $1.9 a day. So that's a huge number of people, isn't it? 10 times the population of the United Kingdom. But COVID-19 has pitched at least over another 100 million people into that extreme poverty from which they will struggle to recover. And so we are now looking at nearly 10% of the world's population living in extreme poverty. And when you start to think about that and then think, how would it make them feel? How does it make their actions every day? What does this affect? You can see the tie up between the important work you're doing, the important work the security services do, the important work the aid agencies do, it's one big ecosystem of importance. And guess what the, the number one thing is, is data. So absolutely, helping these people to move out of poverty is incredibly important. Because so many cities, and that's a poor image, but I took it. Um, basically, so many cities are beginning to look like that. Um, and people have moved in, built their own um, slightly uh, unconventional house to be near that city to get work. Now, what I hope you've sort of realised I've been showing is I've been showing how location is important and professionally we talk about that being geospatial and those analytics. Basically, 
so much of this data is coming remotely and professionally people tend to call that earth observation data um, and it's often now we it's part of the whole space ecosystem that we have in this country and whether you're talking about drone based or you're talking about air based high altitude uh, platforms or you're talking about satellites that's the space ecosystem so something that can see remotely and then we're all very lucky to have the world of AI and what we're seeing is all of those worlds are coming together and what we're absolutely seeing is the importance of this mass of data can only be made sense of because it is so large by the world of AI. And so very much, um, I wrote a paper all about how I believe that the geospatial space and AI worlds are coming together. And they're all really one ecosystem that is now very important and working together. What we know is that it doesn't matter what kind of city we're talking about. But we know cities are becoming smart. And we know the growth of that. You know, basically, that slide at one point used to say $273 billion. And now, that was by 2020. And now it says $873 billion. Uh, uh, sorry, it should be dollars, by 2026. And what we're seeing is that massive growth for smart city solutions, um, which assist greater understanding. But this absolutely is generating so much more data. Just from a transport point of view, everything now has a sensor. Everything now is communicating and everything is now interconnected and hopefully interoperable, taking those data stacks that we talked about. And very much we're seeing communication, location, uh, timing, all coming together and being so vital. But it's absolutely generating such a wealth of data that we can't understand it unless we bring it together both locationally and with the algorithms that are so needed in this community to make a difference. There's no point just having a wealth of data unless we know what to do with it. And what we know is that wealth of data gives us understanding. You know, in the pandemic, lots and lots of people were looking at remotely via satellites at what was happening in shopping centres. And uh, some of it was about policing shopping centres. Some of it was about looking at economic impact. And what we also know, and this is pre-pandemic, that very many people who are leading construction sites are now using those remote resources to really have a good audit trail about what is happening in their new, newly building urban environment. So they may be in London, Chicago, or Los Angeles, but they may be investing in something in Morocco or anywhere else, and they will still be able to monitor it on a regular basis to see, and in this slide, red shows the negative changes and green shows the positive changes, i.e. Negative is destroying the building, and green is building, uh, basically making, uh, rebuilding and redeveloping. Because, you know, how many times, and certainly I've managed things over, you know, in other parts of the world, where program managers have told me categorically it's all going very well. When, when I turn up on a plane, it's not going very well. And so this is giving a lot more transparency. What we also know is there are people making a lot of money in data. You know, you think of Uber, I'm sure, as a taxi ride company. Well, when you look at their, um, at their kind of uh, financial analysis, 
you realize that actually they're making a lot more data, a lot more money out of the urban analytics that they're now using. They have a huge geospatial team, as they call it, and they are now advising cities on traffic management. They're advising cities on planning. They're advising uh, how to develop cities in many parts of the world, both in the developing and in the developed world. And for some places, they are, believe it or not, very much the mapping community for the country. They are providing some of the mapping that their countries haven't had. So they're playing multiple tasks. Now you've probably seen images like this, and images like this are very useful, and um, I could, could ask somebody if they know what it is. Well, it's exhaust data out of your mobile phone, uh, okay? It's, um, you've got apps on that uh, absolutely do not give away your identity, but it just tells people where your phone is, where that exact handset is. And um, people announced, and there was an excellent talk at Geo Business last week, um, from Warren Vick of Europa Technologies showing what he's able to do with this data. But I use this data in a completely reverse way and hence just why I wanted to illustrate it. I use it to realize places where probably there isn't electricity and hence there I'm looking for some of those 1.9, those people living on less than $1.9 a day. Because when you see, I could have put in pictures of when, what, what you see in collected places, and it was on the television a couple of nights ago when they were looking at camps in France. One of the biggest areas is where you're plugging in your mobile phone. Even in refugee camps, that is one of the key things. So one of the first things people want to do is communicate, because in many parts of the world, as becoming in our own country, but we're slow at it compared to Africa. The mobile phone has been the banking system for a very long time. So people couldn't move money without having their mobile phone. And hence, you realize if they don't have a mobile phone, it's possibly because there's no electricity, there's no solar, and hence, these are the areas where uh, if you overlay looking at population, you can see where are the harder to reach people. We're also seeing all the time that uh, the coming together of uh, analytics uh, is helping in every sector of the community. In the construction industry, more and more people are now using this in order to do their environmental assessment of uh, what's happening in their urban environments. And um, what we're seeing is people able to do these analytics very clearly to meet the environmental assessments that they now need to do. And we're also seeing very much using AI, space, and those analytics, people being able to look at stockpiles, which again affects the financial markets. And there are plenty of some of the biggest institutions in the world now combining those three areas, geospatial space and AI, in order to increase, sometimes down to, I've worked for a couple of places, it was absolutely getting five seconds ahead of arrival in order to change the stock price. But it's using our world. Then. One of the things that's interesting is how do we look at data here in the UK? And um, we tend to think about it in different ways from different authorities. Different authorities, whether it's the Office of National Statistics, the Land Registry, the local authority, utility organisations, ordnance survey, or insurance companies or the Royal Mail. They're all collecting data, and they're all looking at the world in a different way. Uh, but absolutely, that combination 
really starts to make our digital world. And what we're now seeing is a great attention here in the UK. We've already perhaps solved a lot of the geographical land problems because we basically started in 1791 uh, doing that problem and that was by having ordnance survey and then all the additional data that comes from many, many different sources in the UK, including OpenStreetMap and other, other areas. But we're now beginning to start to look at the underground assets of Great Britain, because those underground assets are equally as important. So in the developing world, they're still trying to solve the problems we've already solved. Here, we're going one further, because we do have quite a mess under our streets. And um, it's all about going to be solved, absolutely, by aggregating data. And you'll be fully aware of headlines like this, where um, you know 160 roadworks in 12 months, and that you know a lot of money is being spent, and a third of the water mains network in the capital is more than 150 years old. But where are they? Nobody knows. You know, basically, um, that's the scenes we see, and these are the scenes of what we used to see. So, very much, it's about absolutely looking at what we have, very much looking at the geography we have, and then planning for the future. And if you're not aware, there is now something that's been launched by the UK government called the National Underground Assets Register. Um, and this is a, going to be a huge investment for Britain. And it is about bringing together all of those assets. They've done the pilot projects. They've been successful. They're now investing in this. And you can see the uh, economic value. That's, uh, you can read the economic report that's on the web, et cetera. And um, you know, reduced costs of sharing data, saving, 190, uh, saving 91 million pounds per year. So again, it comes down to data. Now, another area we also need to think about is disaster management. You're probably aware of the disaster management cycle, where there's a disaster, an impact, there's a response, and we tend to hear about the response. The response is on the news. We often don't hear about the recovery, the development, the mitigation against another response, and then the preparedness. And preparedness is where all of you come in because analytics is absolutely helping us with preparedness. It helps us throughout that whole cycle but let's try and move away from having lots of global disasters and let's move to having preparedness. But it absolutely comes down to data. And we know about these temperature anomalies. We know about global land and ocean. We've seen it at the COP26. And we know it's really, really important. And as a result, we are all thinking about extending that data stack, making sure that we really do have hazards absolutely well documented, exposure on absolutely the built environment, vulnerability, absolutely the socioeconomic data. And then how can we build resilience on top of that? And there is something called the geospatial concept of operations. And um, basically, it's about looking. And if you track um, sort of the hurricane, for instance, you know, the hurricane leads to flood and often then leads to disease. You know, if you then look at um, the severe storm, you know, um, you, you will, uh, sorry, the wildfire. The wildfire then often leads to a severe storm, 
leads to flood. And it is about tracking these through and how can we prevent those. And it all comes down to those uh, analytics. Because very much what we're seeing in that urban environment is so badly affected now. This world also brings us transparency. I won't go into some of the things I do, but this is just a nice example. Basically, you know, there's a big explosion, it's reported, and nobody quite knows what's gone on. And also people, you know, sometimes news, news journalists report there were no injuries. Absolutely, our world can clearly help change that. And I happen to be the patron of a, a charity here in the UK called Map Action. Map Action works globally, and they are the first responders in that disaster time when the geography has changed. And here they are bringing together multiple pieces of information about what really had gone on in Guinea and providing it to everything from the US Marine Corps to the uh, to the first responders and also helping national newspapers understand what's really gone on so the true story comes out for the population. Now just to finish, none of us can really predict the future and even Bill Gates got it wrong, 640k RAM should be enough for anyone. But what we know is this is a very fast changing world and we know that the landscape of location-based data is becoming busier, busier, and busier. And what does that mean? It means more and more and more data is coming on stream every minute. We know that um, there will be something in between satellites and drones, and these are high-altitude platforms they're, they're re really nearly here. They're either solar or hydrogen powered. And the advantage is they'll be able to be put up for three months, monitor, and then they can return to Earth and the sensor could be changed or recalibrated or whatever. So there's all of that, which you know, changes the face. Even though satellites, some of you will read about, we can now do in-orbit servicing of a satellite it's a bit like you have your car serviced, you can now have your satellite serviced, but you know, these will be yet another part of that whole data landscape. Then, very much, I believe the whole of our future is very much going to be dependent on living in the digital twin world and how the digital twin will become so much of our world and your world is the digital twin world. And from my point of view, what I'm already seeing is changes in that world. And one of the things I used to wrestle at when I was uh, leading Ordnance Survey was how did we really loft the 2D data into 3D? And now there are companies like One Spatial who absolutely have cracked how to loft absolutely perfectly accurately to precision to get that the, the whole uh, lofting and roof to be absolutely geometrically accurate. And so creating national 3D building uh, uh, models is so much easier than it was even five years ago. Then what we know is we have the metaverse. And this is going to probably dominate your own careers as you go through. It's very much about harnessing the power of all of the technologies, including augmented reality, virtual reality, video. And what we're seeing is um, people who are interested in you know, investments and things, believing that this is a huge, huge market. And I was briefing somewhere in Europe last week and absolutely, the investment community sees the metaverse, sees the urban metaverse as key to the future. And um, so if you've been worried about the relevance of what you do, I can assure you that is absolutely key. Everybody is seeing that.
Because even though there are very large companies working in the metaverse, large companies always are stoked by small companies, small startups, um, medium-sized companies. You know, behind those big brands, there's always small brands. You know, where did Google Maps come from? Came from a small company called Keyhole and uh, absolutely grew into Google Maps and Google Earth. And that would be the same for the whole metaverse. And what we're already seeing, and uh, uh, John Radoff is a commentator on the metaverse, absolutely, guess what it's saying? Geospatial mapping as part of that community. And we might think, well, it's still quite a long way away, but actually, the planning in the metaverse is already happening in some cities. Some of you may have heard of Neom City. If you hadn't, haven't, it's a city that's going to be 10,200 square miles. It's on the coast of the Red Sea. It's taking up 473 kilometers of the coastline. And unbelievably, it's a line. And that's what it's called. You can read about it on the web. It's not secret. And it's going to have a pedestrian layer, then it's going to have a service layer and a spine layer. And it's all based on data. Now, we here in the UK are quite lucky because a lot of this work is being led by a man who's reasonably well known in Britain uh, called Mansour Hanif. Mansour was the deputy head of Ofcom, the uh, uh, the regulator for communications. He's been in digital for years. I've chaired him twice in geospatial community um, uh, committees that I chair. He's been involved in the satellite applications catapult. And what he's very much doing is bringing the virtual world and the main world and modeling the two together as he builds Neon. He is the uh, executive director of engineering uh, in, for technology and the digital sector at NEON. And he says the virtual world will be made lifelike using virtual reality and augmented reality and future residents can get a glimpse of life in NEON through the digital twin being built in the metaverse, which will be the same experience as they would in the soon be physical city. He also said, it's not about smart cities. And this is clearly something you could debate. It's about the cognitive city. And he talks about how residents and people get more involved the moment you talk about it as a cognitive city rather than as a smart city. And it, the cognitive city brings in the whole social element that many of us have done in social geography and other areas of understanding the patterns of residents. Just finally, what we know is we absolutely here in the United Kingdom, we're extremely lucky. We have entities like the Alan Turing Institute. You have great university courses. We are leading in space and in the next uh, uh, year, you'll start to see launch happening here. We are actually building launch sites in the UK. We've, uh, the government's invested in one of the premier communications wor uh, wor uh, companies uh, in, s in space. And there is a lot of investment going into these areas. But absolutely not in any way, shape or form to the extent that other countries are doing. What we're seeing is in China, there are whole cities that are information cities and they bring together space, AI and geospatial together. I'm seeing it in other parts of the world as well. And so absolutely, all of you studying here in the United Kingdom, um, you know, absolutely, it's brilliant that you'll be contributing very much to uh, everything we do because I hope this talk has given you a little insight into how important it is to um, the whole globe that we are successful and that location really does have a role in solving urban issues facing our world and very much you yourselves have a role too. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Vanessa. A really great talk. Uh, Alex Singleton, University of Liverpool. Um, you said right at the start of the talk um, that the geospatial industry had sort of moved from um, technology-led to being more strategic um, strategy-led. Mm. Do you think that's a risk? Because obviously a lot of what you've talked about today has been around some of the really interesting new technologies, and that's you know technologies applied to data. If we withdraw from that, um, is there less of a role for geographers? And are those really interesting technological innovations of which you presented likely to be happening elsewhere? A very good question. When I meant technology-led, um, certainly when Mark and I first got involved in, uh, in this world, he was very unique. Mark, oh good, you've moved out of the back area. He was very unique because he was using technology in order to give great solutions to people like Mercedes-Benz, GSK, uh, Walmart. And that was a real leap because wherever else you went at the same time, people talked about um, the technology and what it might do. Whereas they actually had a real customer who was helping them define what they needed the, um, they needed the technology to do. So actually, I don't at all believe that it's about moving away from technology. It's absolutely what we want is more innovation, but it used to be that this whole industry was constrained by what the technology couldn't do, and also how challenging it was to make it work. Moving large files around. I can remember waiting, I used to, I helped create the first geography for the elections in South Africa. And it would take me, something that would now take maybe five seconds, I can remember waiting 17 hours and just refreshing in the hope it wouldn't crash. So those were the technology days when really we were stretching things so much in order to get those answers. However, what we're now seeing is customers coming with problems and we have technology together with innovation that can help solve it. So um, the one thing I would also say is the role of geographers, if you are a geographer, I realize we'll have computer scientists, we'll have all kinds of people in the audience, but the role of geographers is just as important today as it was right at the beginning because you learn in geography so many different elements uh, about that are important to combine to help customers have those solutions. Whether the customer is talking about climate change or whether they're talking about uh, um, supply chain issues, absolutely it all comes down to working with both the algorithms and computer science world and the geographical world. So I think you've got a great future. Thanks, uh, thanks for that talk, it was really interesting. Um, Ed Manley from University of Leeds. Uh, I thought, I just wonder if you could comment on the sort of challenge in your talk where we have these major global challenges like slums and uh, extreme poverty. At the same time, we have the creation of these, you know, new technologies by these big tech companies like the metaverse and so forth. And there's almost a sort of burgeoning inequality between the two. And how do we, as people working on urban analytics, uh, you know, do, do both at the same time, if you, know what, if you see what I mean? We, we, sure. We're trying to tackle these major problems, but yeah. at the same time, they're being exacerbated by discrepancies in the access to technologies and, and skills. Absolutely. Well, first of all, just to clarify, when I was talking about the metaverse, I was talking about it in the more generic terms, nothing to do with Facebook and meta and all of those things. Um, but um, one of the things, you, you are quite right, in some ways it's exacerbating, but in some ways it's not. Um, I work a lot in, in slums, in refugee camps, in 
parts of the world you wouldn't want to go to, frankly, sometimes. Um, and uh, the way we can help democratize and include the population is now so much better than ever before. One of the key enablers to moving people out of $1.9 a day or less is uh, land rights. And um, whether they be, you know, we have here, um, some of you may have experienced um, getting, you know, either by your parents or yourselves buying a house. And what you might not realize, you might kind of be a bit cross about the process and it takes a long time, you might consider. I'll tell you, it's really streamlined compared to the rest of the world. Because or once you own something, then you can get a loan against it. And so establishing land rights in a country is incredibly important. And we have the land registry, and you might think everyone else has one of those. I can tell you there are only 56 countries that really have, or it may be a bit more now, it may be up to 90, but you know, of the 198 effective countries in the world, um, well, depending how you count them, that can be up to 205. Um, basically, less than 50% have effective land, secured land rights against which you can do your work. So to absolutely help a community m map out using, even as basic as a mobile phone, their own borders of where they perceive their land is, and then opening it for consultation with the whole village, and then establishing title for the first time and getting them a title, means that they can, and I've got examples I could have shown you, they can then get a small loan to perhaps have five animals, which then gives them income, and hence going forward. The same in slums. It's bringing, A, a lot of transparency, um, I used to work in some of the slums in Africa, in Southern Africa, and um, one of the first projects I ever did which um, was trying to work out why did certain enhancements to a slum area given by a government get burned down. And the reason was they did not understand the population. They didn't understand that when people died, they actually had these pyres and they had to be in the home. And the pyres, if, you're, if you've got a kind of triple access deck place, unfortunately they burn down. So what, you know, and we were able to solve that by changing the, the new structures that were being put in. But one of the things that it does bring is a lot of transparency to what's going on in slums. It also brings a lot of transparency to things like slave labor because you know with thermal imaging and other things we're able to start to map what are informal very informal buildings that shouldn't be being used for dwellings and then fly them at night and see that probably there must be multiple occupation in these places so absolutely i agree that you know new space all this investment that's coming in and we could talk about the venture capital companies that are coming into this whole area and bringing this new innovation. But many of those innovations actually go back and assist some of the least disadvantaged to basically help them uh, either bring transparency to the situation or, as shown in the land rights, move further up the, uh, the, the, the game towards being uh, moving out of extreme poverty. If you think 40% of the world lives on less than $5.25 a day, okay? So when you start to think of that, moving out of extreme poverty is really important. But when 40% of the world's population lives on in that, then you start to really understand what a big task we've got to do. Okay, thanks, Professor. I am now going to take one question online, and then, uh, so I think, well, I was got the mic, and then uh, I might finish with the uh, one selected chairman's question. 
I'll take them short. We actually have three questions in online now, Mark. Maybe I can squeeze a couple in. Okay. So uh, the first one. I know why we've got to finish at 12, haven't we? So I'll be quick on answers. First one's from Mark Mon Williams, who's a professor at Leeds. Uh, he says The question that always haunts me is how we feed these data insights into policy change. Any thoughts? Absolutely. Um, basically, uh, more and more I'm seeing policyholders absolutely understanding geospatial. Um, whether it be here in the United Kingdom or I was lucky enough to establish for the first time a brand new part of the UN. Um, a, a new part of the UN, the official UN, hadn't been set up for 20 years. And I was invited to set it up in 2011. And there's an, it's called the UNGGIM, United Nations Committee of Experts on Global Geospatial Information Management. And if people are having problems getting ideas fed into policy, that is another good forum. And uh, the United Kingdom very much supports that, and I can always help get things through. And um, basically, I am seeing more and more greater understanding everything from, you know, uh, cabinets downwards of how to get these changes made. And um, if people need help on that, I can, I can help on that. Okay. Super, thank you. Uh, one more from Fernando Benitez, who's a postdoc at the Turing. Uh, he'd like to know your opinion on ethical and privacy concerns relating to current metaverse initiatives and the role of the geospatial world in addressing those issues. Okay. Well, ethical concerns are key to, it uh, takes up a lot of my mind, actually. But, um, uh, and it's interesting, this morning I actually wrote to somebody in the Turing because, um, as you'll know, the Turing has a very clearly, you know, we're working on ethics in the Turing um, very strongly, and uh, it's really important that the algorithms do not have ethical, any, any uh, uh, ethical concerns and we mustn't be introducing bias into them. But the geospatial community has launched something called the Locus Charter. It's backed by many organizations around the world, everything from the Mexicans to the British government and the UN, and it's a 10-point plan about to address um, the ethical ways that we must use geospatial data. So this whole area is vitally important and is something that must underpin everything we do, okay? Now, there are bad people who use geospatial, who use AI, and clearly that's for other people, uh, other sources in the world, such as our military, who now have a very developed cyber reserve forces, if anyone wants to join those. And, uh, you know, clearly um, we know that for all the good we do with these things, there is always somebody who is using these things for bad. But it's a bit like, I was lucky enough to be the head of geospatial for the London Olympics and somebody said to me, you shouldn't have any of this data available. It must all be hidden. And uh, we were very much able to prove that it was much better to have 51 organizations who were running the Olympics all using the same geospatial uh, base uh, in an open way. Uh, and importantly, planning everything from the movement of the 137 dignitaries through to managing the torch relay than saying everything must be hidden. So there will always be, sadly, people who work against us, but let's hope not too many. Thank you. Thanks, Professor. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm quite keen to try and get a, a five minute break before the next okay. session if we, if we can. But I, yeah, I would take um, another one from the roving mic if, uh, if there was one. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't see the hand. Was it, um, where was the hand? This lady. Oh, Tao, yeah. yeah. 
Hi, I'm Tao Chen from UCL Space Time Lab. Thanks, Melissa, for a very wonderful, wonderful talk because we're looking back and also look at the future. So maybe my question is more, can we say, want to see your view because as you say, there's geospace, geospatial space and AI with the time on is getting more and more integrated. You also showed us a lot, lots of great, great opportunities as you mentioned in the first two questions, um, reply to the first two questions. So from my perspective, probably can give me more insight. I think you also mentioned probably uh, a little bit as well, say, what you say is the biggest challenge as well. I know there's lots of opportunities. So what do you think about say, the biggest challenge? I mean, we may facing and also, especially from the subject perspective, I know Ed has mentioned a little bit. So, you know, there's so many things we need to learn, we need to know, as you say, underpin is the geospatial, but how to keep it? So I think that's okay. something. Thank that's you. Really what I think the biggest challenge is, it's that we don't have enough of you, okay? Absolutely, we need, you know, to, to really make some of the, to address some of the grandest challenges. We need more people to absolutely want to work in this field. And um, we really are short of people. And uh, some of you may say that's great because then the price goes up and I'm more expensive when I hit the market. But actually, the challenges are so great. So I would encourage, this is a burgeoning area, growth area, and one in which you are guaranteed employment. So I would ask you to encourage all your flatmates who are wondering what to do, et cetera, to think about coming into this area. Okay? Did you have a question? It's I, bound to be too hard for me. I did have a, I, yes, I did have a question. And uh, yes, it's, it, it's, well, okay. So, um, you, uh, Vanessa, you, you, you talk very eloquently about geospatial data, AI, about space. You presented some, you know, really big issues and opportunities for us. And now I'm looking at, this, at the uh, words behind you. It says, towards urban analytics 2.0. Um, you know, I just wondered if you'd like to say, you know, I, I, I know it's, it, it, it's your view that we, you believe maybe we could be a bit more ambitious in terms of the urban analytics program, in terms of the breadth of the problems that we take on in, <laughs> in geospatial. Would you like to say, and, and then, would, you, okay. would you like to say a word or two more about that? You bear in mind yes. that we've got another you know, day well, or so to debate that with the, okay. uh, with the audience. Well, first of all, I never have called into doubt anything you're doing, Mark, but Mark very came, kindly came and did a talk for me last week, this geo business, and it went down a storm. I was naughty and I asked him if he would do 101 What's AI um, for the first about six slides, and that was really helpful. Um, all I wanted to, the challenge we were discussing over coffee beforehand is I hope you've understood you know, you've realized from my talk how important urban analytics is, but it's set within an even greater context of the globe. And your work on urban analytics is incredibly important, but it's all part of the ecosystem of looking at everything from the global indicators, the global issues of climate and many of those things, which need very much some of the same skills, right down to the localized area, um, where you know, you're making an impact on the ground as Mark used to when he was doing his work with GMAP, or you know, I do when helping organizations to think about the power of their own data. So, what I was very much saying is, you know, how much of what you do could you translate into other areas? And um, really, from my point of view, I think it's absolutely fabulous you are studying here and being involved in all of this. But your impact is incredibly important to both our country and to the globe. And perhaps you'll be able to debate that over the next few days or the next day. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Vanessa. Let's uh, um, thank Vanessa once again for...